So it's been a while since I've talked about the PinePhone Pro. I was uh, looking for software updates yesterday, actually, and I came across um, this one from Manjaro. So we're over here on the PinePhone Pro software releases website. Um, and if you scroll over here to Manjaro ARM or Manjaro ARM and come to their, I'm running Fosh, uh, on their dev or stable channel, pop that open. This beta 25 uh, released two days ago. I saw it yesterday. I installed it, and I got to say, I'm, I'm pretty impressed with the progress being made on the GUI front. Um, we're going to come back to this. We're going to talk about it a little bit later. But for now, let's jump into the phone and see where we are software-wise, compatibility-wise, and see what's changed over the past six or so months since the phone's been released. All right, so we have the phone booted up here. Let's go ahead and unlock it. So this is Monjaro Fosh. Um, not much has changed in the UX department. It still kind of follows the same paradigm that Fosh has always followed, which is this app drawer here, which is your home screen. You can scroll through your apps there. If you have apps that aren't mobile friendly, you can unlock them there. Um, top bar with you know your clock, your battery, and some widgets, applets over here. Uh, and then your phone, messaging, internet, contacts, that sort of thing. So not much has changed there. What has changed, a couple things. Number one, I feel like they've optimized the software a little bit. The animations are a lot more fluid than the last time I used it, which was, um, I believe, Arch Linux around May of 2022. So that's nice to see the user experience getting a little bit better, the optimization getting there. Um, what also has changed is instead of tapping the top bar to bring it down um, menu stuff, is you can now slide it down. You'll get your notifications, um, settings for cellular, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, battery, rotation, all of that sort of stuff. You have your lock button over here and power button over there. Uh, this is a nice quality of life change. It seems like it would be pretty small, but it's much more intuitive, especially if you're coming from Android. Um, when I was daily driving Fosh with the PinePhone Pro, I would continuously try to swipe down to get to these sorts of settings but on every other version of it, you would have to just tap and it would bring it down. So that's a welcome change. Um, it's a small thing, but again, it, it does make a difference in the usability of it. Um, the operating system as a whole, I think is really, really close to daily driving. I've always been um, a real big fan of Fosh and, and um, what's the other one, KDE as well. And on both of them, I think they're really close to having a, a post beta release there are a couple things holding it back. Number one is power management is still broken. Now, it does have suspend. Ever since we um, got, what is it, Toboot installed, suspend has been working on Mobian, Arch, and Manjaro. And so when the phone is like shut down, shut down, the battery life is fine. It bleeds about probably two to three percent every hour, which is fine to get you through like a day of work, get back home, get it into a charger. The problem is there hasn't been much in the way of uh, power management while the phone is being used. It still bleeds power a lot with the screen on and with programs running. Um, let's do a little experiment. We're at 92% right now. Let's just uh, go to YouTube and play a video real quick. All right, we have Cat realizes his owner is pregnant. Okay, so that was about a minute of playback, 51 seconds, and in that time, we've gone down 1%. So with normal use, that's about normal for me. Um, video playback is about 1% a minute. Uh, normal phone usage hovers around the same. And so it's just a completely unusable phone if you intend to use it like you would use an Android or an iPhone. If you're one to just like browse the internet, social media, um, just be on your phone for longer than phone calls or text messaging, you're gonna go through a battery in probably about two hours, realistically. Which, as a phone, it, it's, it's pretty horrendous battery life. Um, 
The second biggest issue that keeps me from daily driving this and would probably keep most normal users from daily driving is we don't have the camera working yet. And so if I go to megapixels and try to boot it up, it just comes to this blank screen and it dies there. And then I have to come up here and just get out of it. Uh, the reason for that is there's no driver for the actual hardware yet into the kernel. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. But aside from those two big hangups, everything else is working pretty well. Um, phone calls work for the most part. There is a tendency for the modem to get, I don't know what you would call it, clogged um, and get some like low quality calls or um, missed calls, dropped calls. That happens from time to time. Another thing I've run into is if your phone is suspended, there's a chance that you will just miss calls like your phone won't wake when you're getting a phone call, which is kind of problematic if you intend to use this as a phone. Um, but for the most part, the calling app works. Uh, messaging, this one here, works pretty well. It sends and receives SMSs, no problem, at least for Mint Mobile, which is what I'm using. Um, multimedia messages are still hit or miss. I haven't been get, able to get them working on Fosh, but I was able to get them working on KDE. So your mileage may vary with multimedia messages. One thing I haven't been able to get working is group texts. And I know group texts are important for a lot of people. They're important for me. I haven't been able to get group texts working, but that might be user error. I'm not sure if other people have been able to get group texts working. Uh, Firefox is a capable browser, no issue there. And all the rest of the apps are fine. Um, I would like to see a little bit more in the way of mobile app development, um, but we'll talk about that a little bit later. So aside from those couple hangups, which is power management and um, hardware support, especially in the way of the camera, I think this phone is really, really close to daily driving. If you don't need a camera and if you don't have a lot of use for your phone as little more than text messaging and making phone calls, you'll be able to daily drive this, no problem. Got the sun up ahead a little bit. Um, I'm outside doing the recording. Uh, I'm barbecuing some pulled pork, so I just wanted to bask in the smell a little bit. It's, it's delicious. Anyway, so that's the phone. Let's go ahead and get into my thoughts about where Pine Phone is, where it's going, and what some of the hangups sort of are. So number one, I think the biggest hangup for Pine Phone Pro and Pine 64 is their insistence on being a hardware manufacturer without contributing a lot to the software side of things. On their website, they're pretty transparent about how they give you hardware and it's up to community support to get the software and the kernel running. Um, and so without a lot of incentive, especially financial incentive, you're kind of leaving a lot of the development up to hobbyists, enthusiasts, and people who might be working for larger Linux institutions like Red Hat or uh, Canonical to kind of do a lot of the work on their end. This is in a difference or a contrast to what Purism was doing with the Librem 5. So Librem 5 was another open source or semi-open source um, hardware Linux phone. But what they were doing was developing, I believe it's called Pure OS, yeah, Pure OS, um, uh, for themselves in-house. And that was being used on the Librem 5. I've never used Librem 5, so I don't know how smooth it is, but I do know that Fosh, or PureOS, was essentially forked by these other developers for PinePhone Pro, so I'm guessing it's probably pretty similar. But the nice advantage that Purism had is they were actually contributing upstream to the development of these operating systems. Um, without financial incentive, again, I'm not so sure how quickly these operating systems are going to be developed, certainly not at the breakneck pace that iOS or Android are developed. Um, that being said, it is starting to feel like mobile Linux is dead in the water, um, at least for the time being. You'll notice if you go to Purism's website that they're not even really shipping the Librem 5 anymore. I'm not sure if it, they say it's shipping part procurement lead times. I kind of have the suspicion that they've depleted their inventory of them and probably just aren't going to restock them. Maybe they'll release a Librem 6 
Um, I'm not entirely sure what's going on on their end, but I do know that you can't get the Chinese manufactured Librem 5 anymore, but they still do have some US manufactured Librem 5s on hand that you can buy. But I think Purism is kind of stepping back or reapproaching how they're gonna work on mobile Linux. Um, we already talked about PinePhone Pro and how they're approaching mobile Linux. Um, and the issue with that is everything has kind of come down onto this gentleman here. Um, I believe his name is Meggy. And he's pretty much the only person I could find still doing stuff for the development, for back end development of mobile Linux. Uh, every update I see on Reddit or on YouTube is kind of on the back of this, I, I believe he's a man, on the back of Meggy here. And so when you have what amounts to essentially a hobbyist doing almost all of your development, then things are necessarily gonna go at kind of a snail's pace. And the problem from my perspective is if you're trying to get an operating system that's going to reach parity with Android or iOS, you're not gonna do that by going slower in development than they are. And so I'm not sure what the answer is, but what I would like to see as these devices mature and as the operating systems mature and as we get close to a consumer-friendly Linux phone is having a company like Gnome or Red Hat or Fedora, you know, a, a Linux company that has a lot of resources and a big developing team, pick up the slack for developing for mobile Linux. Um, I'm not sure if the need is there. I don't think that they necessarily see the need since they're mostly, you know, targeting corporate contracts and most corporations don't care about a Linux phone. They're already using Android or iOS for their uh, fleets. So it doesn't really make sense to throw a whole lot of money into mobile Linux. But without a large bankroll, I'm not sure a Linux phone will ever reach parity. I don't think the demand is there from the users. Um, similar to how Linux, you know, the, the demand is there from desktop Linux to actually get development rolling. But I don't think the demand is there for mobile Linux to the same degree. I think most even Linux users uh, are happy or content or fine with Android or iOS, um, especially the more diehard ones like me who will flash a custom ROM onto an Android phone to kind of like get away from the Google monolith. Um, I think that satisfies most people's use case. I, I think Linux phone is still too niche to allow or, or to warrant the community being the sole developer behind it. Um, that being said, I do want to commend Meggy for his um, work on the kernel. I know recently he's gotten the, the camera at least to take photos via the command line, which is huge. I think we're on the cusp of getting finally a working driver for the phone. But what happens in a couple years when they release new hardware? Is it going to just fall back on his shoulders to get the kernel up and running? Is Purism or is um, uh, Pine64 going to step up and actually provide financial support for a team of developers? Are other projects, I mean, right now, really, Manjaro is the only one doing anything for user experience or, or GUI stuff. The last update from Arch was, I think, in May. I'm not sure when the last date for Mobian was, but it's not as up to date as. Um, the Manjaro one, so it kind of feels like the whole entire Linux phone ecosystem is really just three people. It really feels like it's Manjaro doing GUI stuff, Meggy doing kernel stuff, and Pine64 doing hardware stuff. And if any one of those pillars falls, then the entire structure comes down and, you know, Linux phones are dead. So I, I don't want to be so pessimistic and say that there's no future for Linux phones, but I am getting a little bit concerned with the slow development of it, the fact that really crucial elements of the phone haven't been addressed in the form of power management, battery drain, and hardware kernels, um, and that there doesn't seem to be a lot of push from the people kind of developing the hardware to provide back-end support for software developers. Um, so that's where I am right now. It, it's in a better state than it was when I bought the phone, but it still isn't in a usable state for daily driving for most use cases. Again, if you don't use your phone as a phone, um, then you'll be fine. Or if all you do is use your phone as a phone and nothing else, you'll be fine daily driving it. Um, but if you are coming from Android or iOS and expecting a Linux 
phone that is at parity with those devices, you're going to be very disappointed. It is not there yet. Um, and I'm not sure if the PinePhone Pro will ever get there. Maybe a second gen Pro model will, but you know, that remains to be seen. All right. Thanks guys for tuning in. I'll see you in the next video.